way back in 2003, I walked into my brother's apartment in Memphis and I saw this book sitting on the floor. It had a bright red stripe on the bottom with white lettering, simple, that said the bike riders. The photograph on top was a black and white photograph of about four motorcycle riders cresting a, a, a rise in a rural interstate. I immediately was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen, just the, uh, the look and the feel of it. Then you start opening it up and there's, there are these incredible photographs, black and white photographs. But in that edition, which was a reissue of Danny Lyon's original book, um, there were color photographs. And for me, the color photographs just jumped out. I think one of the things that took me the longest was trying to figure out you know, how to turn a book of photographs into a narrative film. Obviously, there is a lot of text in the book in terms of interviews, but none of that's a story. They're anecdotes. Um, and kind of like training wheels, I actually started with a big section of Kathy's interview where she talks about meeting Benny for the first time. So that actually, it, it really was. It was like um, putting you know, training wheels on to, to try to get my balance in this story. But from that point on, I really had to start um, inventing. And the biggest thing that I invented was the idea of this love triangle. Uh, the thought that you would have this woman that falls in love with this young, wild guy, uh, but then you have the leader of this club who also falls in love with this young, wild guy. So instead of having a love triangle between two guys fighting over the same woman, you have this man and this woman fighting over this young, wild man, which obviously, um, in this instance, it takes it out of a sexual context only, and it's really more about what is the essence of this guy? What is it about this guy that attracts these two people so much so that they're willing to, to change their lives for him? This idea that there was a specific thing that, that popped up in a specific place at a specific time, and now it's gone forever. Um, that felt beautiful to me. It felt a little sad. Um, but, but certainly nostalgic. And I loved the idea that you could have something so potent and so vibrant as it's represented in these photographs that then just is gone. Austin actually came first. So I have to give credit to Brian Kavanaugh Jones, my producing partner. Um, the script has started to circulate and uh, I think we got an incoming call from Austin's team. At this point, Elvis had not been released. Uh, in fact, there hadn't even been a trailer out, but the week that I was supposed to meet Austin, the trailer came out. And I remember looking at it thinking, okay, like this guy's doing something in this film. Um, of course, we didn't know to what degree yet, but you could just look at that trailer and say, well, this guy went places for this, for this part. And so on one of my rare trips out to LA, we set up a meeting. It was at a restaurant and I walked outside uh, to greet him. And this tall guy walks up and holds his hand out. And I just immediately was struck by the fact that this is one of the most beautiful human beings I'd ever seen. Um, he's got this deep voice. He's very polite. He's very sweet. He's very humble. Um, and he was very flattering. He gave me a lot of compliments. All of these are in the plus column. And, uh, and I just sat there kind of, you know, visiting with him. And it was undeniable that, that this was a movie star. Francie Maisler, my casting director, tells me, you have to look at Jodie Comer. I start to look at Killing Eve. Obviously, she's very impressive. That show's very uh, dynamic and complex. And then I, I Zoom with her. And quite frankly, before I got on the Zoom, Francine, uh, she basically called and said, don't mess up, like just get her to say yes. Um, which, you know, <laughs> takes a bit of my agency away as a director, but Francine had only done that once before. And that was when we were making Midnight Special. She did it with Adam Driver. Before I got on the phone with him, she was like, and who I had no clue who Adam Driver was. She called and was like, don't mess up, get him in the movie. So I felt like this was one of those moments. There are interpretations that, that Jody um, is making into Kathy's character that are far deeper than the words that are on the page. Some of my favorite parts of Jody's performance aren't just um, this rapid fire um, speech that she's giving. 
it's the moment right after. It's the moment in between her. It's the thing that she does uh, with her face or, or, or with her body posture. It's the kind of work that a director loves to see because it's one thing to take an accent and break it down, which she did. I was lucky enough one day um, at the end of one of her shooting days, she left some of her work behind. And, you know, there's a tremendous amount of dialogue for Kathy in the film. And she had taken every single word and phonetically broken it down to memorize it in that accent. Now that's impressive, but what's really impressive is when she performs it, that all disappears. All of that work is invisible. What makes Tom important in the role of Johnny is he can carry that complexity. He can scare the shit out of you, but then he can also have this extreme vulnerability. I don't quite understand it. Um, he, he is a, he's a force of nature when it comes to acting. Um, and I saw it actually at his house in that initial conversation in London. It's like he vibrates a millimeter underneath his skin. There's something going on with Tom Hardy. And when you put the camera on him, it's all happening at once. He can just be sitting there smoking a cigarette and there's so much going on there. Um, you know, there, there are movie stars for a reason and Tom Hardy is a movie star. I think there was a healthy uh, camaraderie between all these guys, you know. Um, Tom especially though, I think he would, he would ride Austin a little bit, um, partly because Tom used to be the guy cast in, in Austin's part. He said that several times. It was all positive, but, um, but one time that it actually affected something that I was really happy about was um, in that opening bar scene, when Benny comes over to talk to Kathy, he pulls his chair around and sits down and talks to her. And um, of course, we very calculated, we'd put <laughs> Austin in this shirt with the sleeves cut off so you could see his arms and everything else. And, um, and after the first take, Tom yells, uh, who's you know sitting watching this whole scene because he's in the background watching this whole scene. Tom yells out, Hey, Austin, just turn your chair around. Just go ahead and turn your chair around. And I'm pretty sure he was joking. Austin did it. And, um, and then it gave him something to prop <laughs> his arms up on and these massive biceps and triceps and um, glistening, <laughs> glistening in the light. And it had to be one of the most like erotic moments I'd ever seen on film. And we all just kind of were like, uh. and so, um, I don't know what Tom was trying to calculate or do there. Maybe it backfired, but it certainly worked for the film. You know, Danny's a really tricky character in the script um, because he is an observer. And, but he's also, in observing, he's commenting because um, he's not part of this world. Uh, and as written, I think, I think Danny Lyon was actually far more... Um, uh, integrated than, than our, our Danny character. You know, in fact, when I showed Danny the film, uh, the real Danny, uh, he loved it, but he also was like, you know, I should have been grungier. Like I should, I, I didn't quite look that way. And, and, um, and so for me, I think it was important, uh, to have a character that, that could observe without being intrusive. And that's a very difficult thing to ask an actor to do. And I have to give a lot of credit to Mike um, because he was willing to just show up and observe and, but also still be there, you know, to still be present. I mean, there's so many cutaways to his face. We want to know what he's doing. We want to know how he's judging, you know, the things that are coming out of Kathy's mouth and everyone else's, you know? I mean, the truth is no one shoots a film like Adam Stone. And, and I think I'm within my rights to say, he shoots films um, because of the way I direct films. Um, I feel like we've grown together through six films. Adam doesn't shoot a lot of other stuff, you know. Uh, he's very close um, to Michael Roy, our gaffer, who's been our gaffer since Take Shelter. You know, so I think, I think there's something about Adam Stone that he just doesn't make films that look like other people's films. They look like my films, and I'm very proud of that. I think when you use <laughs> slow motion, and, and um, which to my film school professors, 
the technical term is overcranking. Um, you know, when you use freeze frames, when you use anything like this, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big stylistic choice. And from the very beginning of my career, I always kind of eschewed style. It was like, nope, story first. Story, story, story. I don't want to get in the way as a director. I, I don't want to show my fingerprints. I really want the story to come through first. However, there are certain times where um, if you can use it and, and it doesn't stick out, um, then you've really achieved something. There are... Um, off the top of my head, three slow motion shots in the film. The push in on Benny at the pool table is overcranked. Um, and, and the shot of Kathy on the back of that motorcycle where she takes that breath is overcranked. I was talking to Mike before we did the scene, and he goes, you think this is pretty funny, don't you? I was like, yeah, it is pretty funny. You know, you're talking about your mom pulling you out of bed and taking you to the draft board. It's funny. He goes, yeah, I don't think it's funny. And, uh, and, you know, you don't argue with Mike. You're just kind of like, all right, let's see, let's see where this goes. And I can, I can say um, that scene is vastly more complex because of the way that Mike Shannon delivered that monologue. Yes, it does start off. And yes, he funny. And everybody's laughing. But then there's a point where there, there is this turn where he talks about being rejected by that board. And I... I didn't see that part as funny, but I certainly didn't see it as the underpinning for the psychology of this entire subculture, which is what Michael Shannon provided. At some point, he turns and says, we don't want you. You're an undesirable character. We don't want you. And then, because you have these amazing other actors listening, you've got Damon Harriman dropping his eyes. you got Boyd Holbrook pulling his head like this. You know, you've got Carl and Emery and Bo and Norman Reedus, who that was his first night with us, sitting there listening to this. And Norman, just as an example, he comes up to me. He's like, you know, I'd never fully understood in the script why my character wants to stay with these guys and hang out with them. He's like, I get it. Like, they're fun and we have a good time. We're all drinking. He's like, but I think this speech is why. And there is a moment... Uh, that I knew was very important to the film when Kathy is on the back of Benny's motorcycle for the first time and they're crossing this bridge and this whole horde of motorcycles comes up around them and the sounds and the vibrations, it's actually not about Kathy falling in love with Benny. It's about Kathy falling in love with motorcycles and motorcycle culture. Um, and yes, we have the benefit of her voiceover, but it's something you got to feel. Uh, it's something that you have to experience. And so it was a really important uh, piece of the film because without it, all of her actions following don't really make sense. Um, you, have to, you have to watch her fall in love with motorcycles. And there is this shot that's in profile. It's handheld. And, uh, and it's overcranked. It's slow motion of, uh, of her basically closing her eyes and lowering her head, and it almost looks like she's breathing in the back of Austin's jacket, but she's certainly breathing in the moment. As soon as we got that shot, I was like, okay, good. Success for today. Uh, I'm very proud of that scene. And then when you score it to the Shangri-Las, it's, it's the best I could possibly imagine. The motorcycles are uh, the least... <laughs> precise instruments on the planet. These motorcycles, some of which are 60 years old, you know, like we had bikes from the 40s, so that'd be 80 years old almost. I mean, these things, they didn't like it when it was cold, they didn't like it when it was hot, they didn't like it when it was dry, and they didn't like it when it was wet. So um, out of all of the prima donnas I've ever worked with, these motorcycles were the most. Erin is the one that came to us fully built, like she's a professional. <laughs> Aaron is, is not only the adult in the room, but she's by far the most talented person I work with. Um, I, I, I cannot say enough. You know, what she pulled off in the bike riders um, is so dense and so complex. The fact that you look at it and you're like, yeah, they look like bikers. 
I, I think that is a gross misunderstanding of what she had to do in terms of getting period correct clothing, aging, weathering, adding dirt, grease, patches. I mean, they sewed patches onto all of those jackets. The amount of effort that went in to not just making the clothes, but then making the right clothes. The, um, if I, as a director, had to hold someone's hand and walk them through all of the photographs and say, this is what I need and this isn't right and that's not right, we would have been dead, dead in the water. And Erin, again, she not only achieves what's necessary, she goes above and beyond. And when you start talking about, we had scenes with hundreds of period correct extras. Um, the, the amount that she pulled off in the time with the budget given um, is, is extraordinary. Uh, she is, um, I think she's one of the reasons the bike riders feels as authentic as it does. As for Chad Keith and the production design, you know, uh, it's just so incredible to watch people that you've worked with for a really long time, friends that, that you've had for a really long time, just work at such a, a pro level, you know? Like this is the NFL, this is the NBA. Like we're not messing around anymore. And, and to see these people that you knew uh, way younger in life achieve that level and perform at that level is, is really exciting. And, you know, you walk into the stoplight bar, that's kind of the, the Vandals hideout uh, clubhouse. And we took a storefront that had, um, had been a kind of a part-time church, <laughs> I think with purple carpet and, uh, and pews. And, and we transformed it into the stoplight. Um, you know, just using that as an example of the amount of work and, and the amount of detail that went into these sets, you know, they took a, a, a period correct linoleum pattern and had it printed so that they could lay it down um, over the flooring. Um, we took numerous <laughs> examples of glass block and built an entire glass block wall because of one photograph that Danny had given us of the original stoplight. The Bike Riders follows um, the development of a, of a Midwest motorcycle club from the late 50s where it was a regional club just made up of friends through the course of the 60s into the early 70s where it grows into a proper biker gang. Um, kind of end up ending up kind of destroying the original intention uh, for a lot of the members. And the whole thing is, is viewed through the eyes of Kathy, who's married to one of the bike riders. And really, the, the central conflict for the characters in the bike riders is a love triangle between Kathy, her young husband, Benny, and Johnny, the leader of the club. Both Kathy and Johnny are fighting over Benny. Johnny wants Benny to run the club, Kathy wants Benny to stay alive and possibly be out of it. My producing partner, Brian Cavanaugh-Jones, turned me on to an Australian film with Ben Mendelsohn in it called Baby Teeth. I'd never seen it before. Honestly, uh, it's the last film I can remember that made me cry. Uh, I, I highly recommend it to anybody um, looking for a good movie to watch tonight. But in that film, Toby Wallace plays a young drug addict and he just pops off the screen. And he's very much like that in, in real life. Um, he's got an energy to him that uh, I really haven't seen in a, in a lot of people. I think Toby's going to be a movie star, hands down. And what he did for us was he added this, um, he added this very honest, sincere danger to the film. Um, because it's not just danger from, from the violence this character is specifically going to inflict, he, it's the danger that he represents of the entire movement through the 60s of, of who these guys could become. I mean, if you look into Danny Lyon, at the age of 19, he became the staff photographer of SNCC, the Southern Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So at the age of 19 in Atlanta, he was roommates with John Lewis and took some of the most iconic civil rights photographs you've ever seen before he even did the bike riders. That's when he went to Chicago and then he started riding with this club and photographing them, not to mention all the work he's done since. Um, the guy's prolific and the guy is, is, the guy is a serious legend um, for American photography. And so for me to show up and, and, and say, hey, I, I really love your book, I wanna do something with it. He was very gracious to me and he's been gracious to me 
um, through the entire process. 